good to be worshiping with each and every one of you, whether you're online or whether you're present here. A couple announcements before we begin. Um, don't forget about the prayer sheets, which are in the pews. If you would like the session or the staff to be praying about something, celebrating something, you just want to leave it blank, that's an unspoken request, you can fill that out, put it in the offering plate in the narthex on the tea cart, and we'll make sure that we get that online um, on Tuesday morning this week. Um, church offices are closed tomorrow for Labor Day, so just be aware of that. On Tuesday, a couple of our Bible studies begin. Um, Precepts, which is an in-depth Bible study for women here at the church, starts Tuesday at 9.30 in the large classroom. At 10.30 on Tuesday in the, is the men's Bible study. We'll be downstairs in the conference room. And then in about a month, the Tuesday Bible study and prayer group will be studying the Psalms, and they start first part of October. And so be aware of that. That's going to be kicking in. And then a week from Monday, my online Bible study begins. I'll be offering 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the book of, and the letter of Jude, the chapter of Jude. It's pretty quick um, starting. And so we'll be offering that Mondays. It'll be on hopefully by 9 o'clock. And you can access that anytime. You have to be part of the First Presbyterian Church Bible Study Facebook page to do that. So if you'd like to know how to do that, let me know, and I will get you set up. Other announcements that we need to be sharing with each other today. June. Pardon? What about her? Shirley Michael broke her hip, so we need to be praying for her. I hadn't heard that. She's okay. All right, so keep Shirley and Ken in your prayers. And we'll get to that and we'll pray for them later. Anything else we need to be sharing with one another? Let us worship God. Good morning. Good morning. And a welcome to those of you at home and those here today. We appreciate all that you do and all that you are as a part of this service. If you would, please stand. Let's turn our hearts and minds to the Lord and our service today by joining me in the call to worship that's printed in your bulletin. Those of you at home, may follow along. You call us, O God, to serve your cause and celebrate your love. You call from bushes to burn and bellies of the whale, from thunderstorms and whirlwinds, from the mouths of babes, and your still, small voice within us. You call us by name. Merchant and mechanic, hospital worker and homemaker, student and shopkeeper, you bring us together. You quicken our hearts with the power of your gospel. And send us forth as disciples with deepened commitment and unbounded joy, lifting, lifting up our hearts and acclaiming you, Lord, who worship you this day and every day. And if you would, please remain standing. For the beauty of the earth, for 
the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the wonder of each hour, of the day and of the night, hill and vale and tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of light. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the joy of ear and eye, for the heart and mind's delight, for the mystic harmony, linking sense to sound sight. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and mild. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For Thy church that evermore lifteth holy hands above, offering upon every her pure sacrifice of love. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. It's probably a good thing that Ben does what he does, then you don't have to listen to me sing. Thank you. And just, just as a, a note of a reminder, remember that if you're wearing your mask, which I appreciate the fact that most all of you are, make sure it's over your nose. The nose is connected to where it's connected to where it's connected to where you could be infected. All right. Join me with the invitation to confession. We must be honest. All of us sin and make choices that are destructive, hurtful, and rebel against God. We cannot fix this ourselves. Only God can. When we admit our sinful choices and give ourselves over to God's grace and mercy, only then can we be forgiven and renewed. So let us now repent of our sins and confess them to God. Let us pray. Merciful God, you have given us so much. All that we need, your hand has provided. You have blessed us with skills and talents, intending that we use them for the sake of others, to your glory. We have failed to give as we ought and have guarded for ourselves that which you have called us to share with others. Forgive our selfish ways. Enable us gladly to serve you by serving others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For a moment, confess our individual and private sins before our Lord in these moments of silence. Amen. 
Rejoice, O people of God. Again, I say rejoice. Seize the moment of redemption. Recognize the time of salvation. Know that Christ has freed you from defeat and despair. Lift up your hearts for the joy of new life is at hand and found in Jesus Christ. We lift our hearts to the Lord in praise. It's given. We are renewed and we are made whole freed of our sin. Thanks be to God for this redeeming love. Amen. As you know, we don't take up an offering bringing it forward um, in church these days, but uh, you can leave your offering in the, uh, on the tea cart in the back. But we do want to dedicate it to the work of the Lord, so let's pray. Mighty and gracious God, we just thank you for the opportunity to give, for the opportunity to partner with you in mission and in ministry, to engage and to be a part of the work that you're doing here in Bryan, as well as far away places. So Lord, we dedicate this offering to you, and we ask that you use it where it needs to be used the most. In Jesus' name, amen. I know we're having screen issues, and the next hymn is one you don't know real well. 
So I'm going to move into sharing time, and if you pull it up by the end of sharing time, we'll use it. Otherwise, we'll skip it. So let's move into sharing time. Um, what are we thankful for today? Being here. Being here. What else? Two and a half of successful weeks of in-person learning. Amen to that. Cooler weather. <laughs> Not everybody's thankful for that. So, anything else you're New thankful for? Pardon? New opportunities. New opportunities. Amen. Our families. Good. Okay. Let's move to some concerns then. Um, this is really more of a praise than a concern, but Bob Krismer began his treatments for cancer this past week, and he would, they were a little concerned that um, he would not do well in the uh, treatments, and he did really well this week. Um, so keep him in your prayers. Also, we heard earlier that Shirley Michael fell and broke a hip, so we need to be praying for her and Ken. Um, some of you may know from the Great Banquet community, Susie Osborne. Some of you may not. But Susie Osborne last year went through a long journey with cancer and radiation and chemo. Um, they, they found that when they were doing some x-rays for a hip replacement, I think it was. And she had that done in June, and now her cancer has come back. And she's got two large tumors that they're working on and, and all of that. So keep Susie in your prayers, um, Susie Osborne. Other concerns? Our nation in this crazy time in which we live. Okay. I'm going to ask then that um, you pray in silence about these things or anything you want to talk to God about. And then I will share a few things at the end and pray over the congregational prayer list for the day. So let's go to God and let's pray. Lord of the past, the present, and even the future, help us to believe this church has a vibrant and dynamic future. Remind us, Lord, that it does if we stay centered in you and let your grace and your goodness flow from us into the world. Help us to be that raging river that impacts everyone and everything downstream. <clears throat> help us to sow your word in ways with abandon and to engage now in the work you have for us to do. Keep us from holding back or waiting to see what will happen. Instead, help us to trust you with our church and its future and to be busy about the work that you have given us to do. Lord God, we want to pray for those who are on our congregational prayer list today. We think about Dick and Dee Brickle, Michael and Patty Davis, Barb Hamilton, and June Webster. Mighty God, we thank you for each one, for creating them, for giving them life and breath, for implanting your faith within them, for bringing them to Brian and this particular church. And Lord, we're just thankful for who they are, um, how they love, and, and how they serve you. Gracious God, be at work in their lives, where, they, where there's some work needed, where there's some help needed, some care needed. Just be at work in their lives and support them and be their strength, but also use them in ministry wherever they find themselves. Help them always to be a light in the darkness, to be someone that others can see Jesus in. So gracious God, bless them and keep them. Bless and keep us all. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, 
as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So I'm assuming, Rick, we don't have a music piece yet. We do. All right. So we're going to, this is a, a song we've used a few times. It's from the new Presbyterian hymnal, Glory to God. So it's not in your hymnal, which you don't have anyway. But uh, will you come and follow me? And I want you to think about the words of this hymn. And uh, so those who are able, let's stand and praise God. And as he sings the words. No pressure. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Will you leave yourself behind if I but call your name? Will you care for cruel and kind and never be the same? Will you risk the hostile stare? Should your life attract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you and you in me? Will you let the blinded see if I but call your name? Will you set the prisoners free and never be? the same. Will you kiss the leper clean and do such as this unseen and admit to what I mean in you and you in me? Will you love the you you hide if I but call your name will you quell the fear inside and never be the same will you use the faith you found to reshape a world around through my sight and touch and sound in you and you Lord, your summons echoes true when you but call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live. Be seated. Next Sunday, I begin my final sermon series as your installed pastor. It's called Final Thoughts, Words from the Heart. And every sermon is based out of Paul's letter to the Philippians. Actually, in my 39 and a half years of ministry, I've never preached through an entire letter or book. I've kind of hit here and there. Uh, followed the lectionary here and there, or just done topical things, and um, really felt challenged by the Lord to, in the last three months with you, to uh, work from Philippians, because there's so much good stuff um, in his letter to the people of Philippi. And as this church begins to focus beyond my 12 plus years of ministry among you, I think these words from Philippians are extremely helpful in setting you up to succeed 
That's my goal, in setting you up to succeed in the coming transition. You need to approach things from a, a, a hopeful, anticipatory attitude. This is not a time to sit back, but instead, this is a time to engage. If you want your church to stay healthy, to remain healthy, to become healthier overall. So this time of transition is an opportunity. And I believe that God has great plans for this church. But again, we need to engage in this time, not get complacent, not sit back, um, not just wait for God to move. You know, God's going to send us a pastor someday. You know how long that process can take at times. You need to engage right now. You need to be involved right now. You need to be doing the work of ministry right now, whether you have an installed pastor or not. Now, I'm here to tell you, God is moving. But he expects his people to be moving too. To be about his business and the work of his kingdom in an intentional way. And in this age of COVID-19, I also believe that we need to try to do things as safely as we can. But I firmly believe that we need to continue to do ministry and mission and do the work of God, especially in times like this. So I hope the words um, on this Labor Day Sunday are helpful to each one of you. So one day, Jesus was attending the Feast of Tabernacles. Now that is a celebration of the remembrance of the years that the Hebrew people wandered in the wilderness before entering the Promised Land. And they had this feast every year to celebrate that and remember it. Well, at this feast... Jesus proclaims these words, that whoever believes in him, rivers of living water will flow from them. Now, you're gonna, it's easy to miss the one word there, from, because our first inclination is, well, God's going to bless us so rivers of living water should flow into us. That's not what he says. Rivers of living water flow from us to others, and into the world. That's how he wants to bless us. We find these words in John 7, 37 to 39. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. That's a wonderful image. We have this image of a river of living water. That's the picture Jesus is presenting. Now, I've got to tell you, this is not a bubbling, babbling brook. I don't believe either that it's a slow-moving stream. My picture is, and I think the Hebrew backs it up, is the raging, gushing, whitewater-filled river. Think of a river at flood stage and how fast it's moving and and it's just going past, and, and, and that's the kind of picture I think Jesus wants to give us. If the Holy Spirit is involved in your life and in this church, and if Jesus Christ is the center and focus of your life and this church, then a raging river of blessing and goodness and transforming power, Jesus promises, will flow from us and from this church to others. The promise is, is that you and the church will be a vital part of fulfilling God's work wherever you are. You will be enabled to accomplish things for God you never thought possible before. And that's because you're allowing the Holy Spirit to use you in new and mighty ways. So Jesus is using this image of a raging river to make a point. His followers are not to be stagnant pools of calm tranquility. And that seems to be what we want. We want calmness, we want security, we want things to be easy. That's not what he's offering us. Now, you may get that as a piece down the road by being faithful. But he wants us to engage. That means action. You can't sit back and wait for it. To be stagnant means there's no movement forward. No affecting others, at least in a positive way. Usually stagnant pools grow algae. They sometimes smell badly. Um, they're often full of rotting stumps, deteriorating plant matter. And um, they tend to be on the decline and lead to death. 
Jesus wants his followers to be growing, affecting others, full of life, to be generous givers of all they have been given. A stagnant pool keeps all that it gets. It hoards it. A raging river passes on all it gets and affects and transforms all it meets down the river, down the way. It impacts downriver. Jesus wants this church and all people of God, all churches, to be like a raging river, full of life and excitement, always moving forward, affecting and transforming all those we meet and greet along life's path. That is why we are here. A raging river gives all that it has as it passes its blessings on to those downstream. A raging river is generous as it gives itself away 100% every single day. Catch that. It gives itself away 100% every single day. Now note, as this raging river is giving itself away 100% every single day, it is also being replenished 100% every single day. Where a stagnant pool gives nothing away and gets nothing in to renew it. So because the river gives away its treasure, it's renewed and full of life. Because the stagnant pool gives nothing away and hoards what it has, it is not renewed, it is diseased, it is dying. And I think Jesus is using this particular image to challenge us and to make us think about um, are we giving ourselves away as people? And it isn't just money. Money's a piece of it. But is it time, talent, energy? Is it grace? Is it really looking to the future and knowing that God's going to bless us if we stay faithful, um, if we stay on track? If we stay engaged in mission and ministry. Let me get another image. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 15. We get another visual image, and this is a long passage, but it's one you've heard before, I think. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compassion, compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need... You will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that, this is the application part, so that, you can be generous on every occasion, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. People will be thankful for what you give and how you share grace and how you share the gospel and how you share truth and how lives are transformed. That's what that means. If this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, in other words, it isn't just for people in the church, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you approved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. People will be thankful for you sharing the gospel. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace of God, because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So instead of a raging river here, we are presented with the image of a farmer planting his crops. The farmer can only harvest what he plants. As Paul states, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. In other words, you reap what you sow. If we plant sparingly or with great caution and think in the spring, I can't afford the seed... If we in the church don't sow generously, if we're not involved in mission and ministry, <coughs> if we're not staying on track as a church, teaching, preaching the word, 
sharing that with our own congregant, but people outside our walls. That's kind of what he's saying here. If we do that, then in the fall you will not have much to harvest. And you will not be able to support your family in their basic needs or help with others or do the work of God. We need to think about this as the church. Because if we as a church so sparingly, if we never take a risk, if we think only of ourselves and our own needs first, and in times of transition, it's real easy for a church to think only inwardly. That's deadly for a church. If we abandon mission and the work of God, Jesus is in essence telling us we're going to fail. The harvest will fail. And we will not be used by God in a mighty way. This passage from 2 Corinthians reminds us that the seed itself, the ground itself, money itself, time, talent, energy, affirmation, the future of this church itself, all come from God. God will meet our needs if we are faithful to him and his cause. Remember verses 10 and 11 of that passage. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower, God is the supplier. He gives us what we need. We'll also supply and (coughs) increase your store of seed. He will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that, here's the application point again, so you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God, transformed lives. In other words, God blesses us, gives us good things so that we can sow generously, so that we can flow like that raging river and have a mighty impact on others and those around us. God is the source of all we have and are. We are not the source. We're the conduit he uses to reach into the world. But we are not the source. All too often we think we are. And all we have, all we have, is meant to be used to help others, to accomplish God's work, to meet our basic needs and other people's basic needs. I don't know if you would agree with me on this, but I think this is universally true, at least in Brian, for the most part, at least in our people, is that we have been given more than we need. I believe that. I know we have. Judy and I have. Most of the people I know in this congregation are in that place. Have more than they need for the purpose of doing the work of the kingdom so that we can be generous and help others. We trust God to provide for us. And in doing so, that trust leads us to be generous in our giving of time and talent and energy and affirmation and support and, yes, money. But it also means we trust God with our future. That's critical. We trust God with the future of this church. One other thought comes from 2 Corinthians. Paul uh, writes, each, of one, excuse me, each one should give not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Sometimes in the church, it's like, Stewardship season comes along, and we're talking about budgets, and we're talking about giving, and giving more money, and giving more time and effort and energy, and it's like, oh, here we go again. Here we go again. It's the usual money sermon. Um, and, I, you know, i got to figure out a way to give a little more money, because that's what Barry said we need to do. That's not giving cheerfully. That's not giving cheerfully. Um, We're giving reluctantly and under compulsion with that particular attitude. But Jesus is saying, give cheerfully, give joyfully, knowing that a great good work is going to come out of what God wants to do through you here and beyond here. If we give reluctantly or under compulsion, we're acting like the stagnant pool. If we're giving cheerfully, generously, and joyfully, we're like that raging river that affects and transforms all it touches as it flows downriver. One more image for us to process today, and there's a lot of images today. Our Daily Bread, a devotional magazine that a number of you read and and process, has another visual image to help us with the idea of giving and being open 
to being used to accomplish God's work in this place and in this time. This place and this time right now in this time of transition. I don't know who the author is, but this is what they wrote. It's about three kinds of givers, three attitudes toward being, towards being used by God in ministry. He writes, I think it's a he. There are three kinds of givers, the flint, the sponge, the honeycomb. To get anything from the flint, you must hammer it. And even then, you generally get only chips and sparks. It gives nothing away if it can help it, and even then, only with great display. To get anything from the sponge, you must squeeze it. It is good-natured. It readily yields to pressure. The more it is pressed, the more it gives. Still, one must press. To get anything from the honeycomb, one must only take what flows from it. It takes delight in giving without pressure, without begging, without badgering. It gives its sweetness freely. There's another difference in the honeycomb, he writes. It's a renewable resource. Unlike the flint or the sponge, the honeycomb is connected to life. It's a product of ongoing work and creative energy. And one of the reasons honeycomb givers are able to give freely is that they are aware that their lives are continually being replenished. Their lives are continually being replenished. They believe that what they give away will soon be regenerated. So as long as we're connected to the source of all things and all giving, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you can never run dry. When you give freely, you'll receive in like manner. Then the author goes on to say this. He writes, I want to be a honeycomb giver. I want to be the one who can give freely to anyone, no matter who they are, no matter what they have done to me, and know that I will be replenished. I know that I have the source of all life. He lives within me as the Holy Spirit and moves within my heart to tell me what to do. Then he asks a question. What do you try to give? When you are asked to give, does the Holy Spirit have to work on you like flint or a sponge? Or does the Holy Spirit say give and you say, okay? The two passages of Scripture, John 7 and 2 Corinthians 9, that I've been working from today tell us clearly, unequivocal, unequivocally, that God wants us to be honeycomb givers. Freely giving what we have, knowing we are connected to the source of all life, and that what we give will be replenished so we can keep on giving more. This is what a life of faith looks like. This is living water flowing from us into the world. That's the Raging River concept. If we claim to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must live by faith. We have to trust him to replenish us and to meet our needs as we give to him and to God's work. And we're not talking just money here. Money's a piece of it. But it's time, talent, energy, all kinds of other things. It's belief in the future. That God has a good future for you and for me. But if we don't trust him to replenish us, if we don't trust God to meet our needs, to give us a bright future as a church, if we're, if we're kind of wavering about that, then we're not living by faith. We're not trusting God. We're trusting primarily in ourselves. And I can tell you, I'd rather trust God than trust myself because I know at some point or another I'm going to mess up. It's going to be about Barry more than it's about anybody else. That's just our sinful nature. But trusting in God, that never happens. So I want to be, and I want this church to be, filled with honeycomb givers. To be a raging river for God. A farmer who sows with gusto in expectation of a great harvest. A source of living water for the world and the Bryan community. Life is so much better and so much fuller when we live generous lives, when we give all we have, and are to God for him to use. Grace and goodness will flow from our lives and from our church and make a real difference in the world. So ask yourself, am I sowing with gusto? 
Am I a stagnant pool or a raging river for God in what I offer to God? Am I like the flint or the sponge or the honeycomb? Do I give reluctantly or under compulsion? Or do I give joyfully, expectantly, and cheerfully? In some ways, the future of this church depends on how we respond. And if we're open to being used by the Holy Spirit as a family of faith in this time, which begins right now, I want to urge you to get busy, to be that raging river for God in all that you do and all that you say, wherever you go. Allow God to flow out of you into the world. And if we do that, only good can come from that. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope each and every one of you picked up communion before you came in. If not, they're in the basket in the back. But when we celebrate communion, I think we need to be reminded of the fact that God gave 100%. You know, the raging river gives 100% and is replenished every day. God gave 100% when he gave us Jesus Christ. When he gave us Jesus Christ. And he continues to give 100%. Um, God is the greatest giver of all. And if we're God's, we need to trust, strive to trust him enough to be great givers as well. So communion reminds us of just how far God will go, how much he will give to us, because he gives us himself in the person of Jesus Christ. He gives us salvation, second chances, new beginnings, transformed lives and hearts, the opportunity to partner with him in mission and in ministry wherever we find ourselves. So the Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took the bread. After giving thanks to God, he blessed it and broke it, saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat, remembering me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood which is given for the remission of sin. Whenever you drink of it, drink of it, remembering me. I wonder if this couldn't also be pictured today as that raging river. It's a liquid. And Jesus' blood flows over us, into us, and hopefully through us, into the world. So as you take the grape juice, I want you to think about that, of receiving Jesus, but passing Jesus on. Will you pray with me? Mighty and gracious God, we just thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for how you love. We thank you that you are so generous and you give and give and give and give and give. Help us to respond in the same way because we recognize how much you've given us. Everything we have and everything we are comes from you. So gracious God, thank you for coming to us. Thank you for changing us and transforming us. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for flowing from us into the world. That's all you. We're just willing conduits of your grace. Lord God, just be with us as we receive communion, as we receive forgiveness, and help us to pass it on. In Jesus' name, amen. So friends, let's share communion together if you haven't already. Our last hymn for today is an old, old, old hymn, Come Labor On, appropriate for Labor Day, 
but also appropriate for what God calls us to do and who God calls us to be, as he calls us to engage, not to sit back right now, but to engage in this time of transition. So those who are able, let's stand and sing and think about the words. encourage you in these times, in these times of transition, these times of uncertainty, not knowing what's ahead, whether we're going to have an interim pastor in time, what your next pastor is going to be like. First of all, trust God. God already knows who those people are going to be. And he will bring them to you at the right time. Trust him. In the meantime, be that raging river. Be that farmer that sows with gusto. Be a honeycomb giver. Give 100% knowing you'll be replenished and that God will bless you and that people downstream of you, people that you impact and have a connection to, whether you know them or not, will somehow be blessed by your walk with Jesus Christ. Let's go forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Children fed and nourished closer to me, grow in love and love by serving joyful and free. Is my spirit's power filled you? Hear my tender comfort still you. Oh, my children fed and nourished, joyful and free. 